Okay. Good evening. Welcome to Hope Looks Up Bible Study with Dr. Tom Haney on January 24th, 2022. It's good to see you again, both on Zoom and YouTube. Our meeting consists of two parts, teaching and prayer time. Prayer time will follow teaching and is optional, but available to those that have urgent prayer needs. Take a look at the Hope Looks Up website at hopelooksup.org for Bible schedules, previous study resources, and our Hope Looks Up ministry events. Tonight is our third lesson of our study titled, Fear Does Not Need to Control Us. Tonight's lesson is, will the world go bankrupt in the end times? What will happen to the world finances? Scripture is Proverbs 13, 26, and Psalms 37, 31. We will begin with a word of prayer followed by Dr. Tom Haney. Lord, it's a beautiful day to enjoy time studying your word. Thank you for the Hope Looks Up Ministries and our leader, Tom Haney, who makes this study possible. We praise you and ask that your spirit be with, with us as we begin. Thank you to those that have joined us tonight and those who will watch on YouTube. In Jesus' name, Tom. Well, thank you, Chuck. It is really good to see each one of you tonight, and we are praying for and lifting up to the Lord, everyone who does have COVID and certainly has affected so many of our a class tonight, as well as their relatives and loved ones, and and I'm sure many of you listening uh, also have COVID in your home. Just know that we are praying for God to heal each and every one of you. May God bless you and help you. One of the fears that I feel that we wrestle with as believers is not only COVID, and how ironic that we just have taken the last two weeks to look at why is the pandemic continuing, and do we have any spiritual lessons to learn there? And now we see the continuing increase of the Omicron variant, variant uh, throughout the world. But I think another thing is Christians worry about what's going to happen to, uh, will our money disappear? Will it all be gone in, in the end times? So what are we going to do? Will it lose its value? Will the entire world go into bankruptcy? So I have a little three-part series here that I want us to look at about uh, finances. And we're going to start out with, I think, a question that I don't hear ask a lot. I hear a lot of just immediate talk about one world government and one world leader in the tribulation times. I don't hear many people talk about, is the world going to go bankrupt? And are we headed towards bankruptcy at this point? The month of January has been quite ironic as we've seen a free fall in the stock market, primarily for the ones of the stocks that were doing so well the tech in the NASDAQ and the stay-at-home stocks that have profited from the fact that we are in COVID. And so we might ask ourselves, uh, what, what is that doing? In fact, some of those stocks have had pressure on them to even survive as a stock during this month. So we ask ourselves uh, as Christians, it's very disturbing because many Christian investors have considered the stock market as a a safer way, especially if they do bonds and investments that don't involve equities, as a better way to look forward for a viable retirement or a better life uh, in their later years. Well, I want us to take a biblical and a historical look at what the Bible says and what history has proven to us that will happen to world finance in the times leading up to the last days. The present story is bleak. The United States has reached a staggering $28 trillion debt. Every nation in the world has also sunken grossly into debt. So what does the Bible have to prophesy about a worldwide financial collapse? Is something like that imminent? Estimates show that by the time the world reaches 2051, if the United States continues its same spending on a national government level, we will happen to have uh, the world's finances in a, a direct manner. The U.S. will be spending twice as much as the gross national product. That's the money that comes into the national economy and brings the government the money that goes into its coffers. If something does not change, the United States will become like many nations. No feasible way to get out of debt. Let's go back to 1929 when the Great Depression started and realize the United States was only $16 million in debt at that time. Of course, that number would be increased if you factored in inflation, 
Well, let me give you a number that wouldn't be increased if you flat factored in inflation. And that is that the debt was equal to 16% of the gross domestic product. By 1979, that debt had reached $827 billion. In the 1980s, due to the expensive arms race, the debt really shot up. And during the last 20 years with the war on terrorism, which primarily was funded almost in a credit card manner, we primarily paid off nothing on the uh, war on terrorism. We just put it all on the card. And now with the pandemic where the, con uh, the coronavirus pandemic, which has been the source of a endless spending by our government, our national debt is 28 trillion dollars. The chart on the national US debt put out by how much shows that the debt chart will jump dramatically with the recently passed infrastructure bill of 3.5 trillion. And depending on how many parts of Build Back Better gets passed in individual form, I originally was $4.5 trillion bill, estimates show that it is just going to continue to add to this debt. By the time we reach 2051, the United States, as I said, will be spending twice as much as what it's taking in if we continue to spend like we are. We will become like Japan. Japan is a nation that has been so much in debt since 1985 that they have created loans for their government, structured loans that their grandchildren will be required to pay off. They go out 70 and 80 years to pay off these loans. We're headed towards a national economic collapse. This issue is not just economic, but it's moral because it is immoral to have such a horrific debt load on our children, our grandchildren, and even great-grandchildren. I don't hear anybody say anything about that today. I just hear talking about how we need to have this program. We need to have this help. We need to have this and this. I don't hear anybody talking about what are we giving to our children, at least not on an influential level. I hear others say that. This generation, our generation now, will certainly not be able to pay the current debt off in our lifetimes, no matter how much taxation the government piles upon the backs of working people. Well, the Bible in Proverbs 13, 22, says something that I think is pretty clear. It says what God thinks about the need to pass wealth down through the family. And God wrote in Proverbs 13, 22, a good or righteous person leaves an inheritance for their children's children, but a sinner's wealth is stored up for the righteous. So I assume then that the opposite of the first line is also true, that an unrighteous man will spend all of his children's income and his grandchildren's income. And that is exactly what we've done in the United States. There is no way we can pay off this level of debt. Even if we divided it out among every man, woman, and child in the United States, it's a staggering number. It's billions of dollars. So this is something that will continue to be a burden in the generations that come after us. This practice is biblically immoral. I think one of the scariest things in this whole area is to realize that our national debt clock and its numbers are spinning out of control. Remember that our nation is not just paying off the $28 trillion debt, it's also paying off interest that's compounding on that amount. Where does most of this debt money come from? That might interest you. It comes from bonds. A major part of our debt is borrowed from US citizens. We, so the government has to pay us back using our own taxes. A trillion of that debt goes to China. So we are using our enemies as lenders. Well, I think we all are familiar with the passage in Proverbs 22, seven, right? Which warns that the borrower is the slave of the lender. In truth, then we are enslaved to China and to all of our other creditors. Psalm 37, 21 reveals, the wicked borrow, but do not pay back. So not only is it evil to create massive amounts of debt, it is also wicked if the debtors never intend to pay it back. You might ask, the way our government spends money, and that's a question I really have, is do they ever have plans of paying it off? Because I don't hear any less programs. I always hear more programs and higher numbers attached to these programs. I can't even remember government programs that started with trillions 
And now it seems to be the first thing that's brought up in Congress. We're going to have this bill and it's trillions of dollars, trillions of, of, of money. I could see it in COVID getting us out of a health crisis and keeping us from collapsing as a nation. But do we really need trillions of dollars for everything that comes up? Well, let's not just point our fingers at the government. We as Americans need to point our fingers at ourselves as well because the people of our nation have 12 trillion in outstanding personal debt, not counting mortgages. So take away all the money that's owed on primary residences. Our nation has $12 trillion of credit card debt. This Americans spend on credit just as much as our government does. And the Bible calls this wrong. It certainly is wrong. The other reality is this kind of rampant spending on the part of those who have no constraint on their own behavior or their own spending habits will lead to inf inflation. Surprise, surprise. If you don't care how much you spend and the government doesn't care how much they spend, of course we're going to have inflation. Until the last few months, inflation has been something that we've not seen in this nation since the 1970s in intensity. In the 1970s, inflation was so high that it led to a sharp rise in interest rates. I just started the church as the founding pastor at the Creek, and we were at a very desperate need to build. And we re you know we had bank would loan a brand new church the kind of money we needed to build. There wasn't any way we felt we could raise it as, a, as an offering. So we offered uh, shares. We, we put out notes and uh, began to sell these notes for the, for the church, 16 and 18 percent. Our intention, of course, was to pay those off in a few years as we grew and have a more workable government uh, as far as taking care of our debt for the church. And by the way, we did, we did do it. We did pay it off early. We got rid of those high interest rates and we were able to then get a conventional mortgage because we had a building and we had something that uh, allowed us to have some uh, equity that we could borrow against. But if you wanted to borrow money in the 1970s, there wasn't any luck unless you had some pretty major uh, items that you owned. It was possible to pay interest rates for 20% on houses. And 16 to 18% was the going rate for vehicles interest if you were buying car or truck loans. Our society today cannot even fathom that kind of interest rate. We've been living on one to 3% interest for about 10 to 15 years. If we're suddenly, our debt, 28 trillion, has 16 to 18% inflation on it, if the 12 trillion that our country people owe on personal debts have to pay 16 to 18%, uh, we need to realize that our nation will quickly collapse. Inflation becomes the inevitable outcome of high debt. The sad thing is that for those who've been wise and frugal in their spending habits and have set aside money for their retirement or perhaps for their children and their children's children, they'll find that the value of their savings has depreciated very quickly because of the rising inflation. And that's why sometimes we have to make sure that we have some inflation hedges in our investing so that we as Christians don't end up with nothing and our children with nothing. I feel we as Americans need to be calling out to our elected officials saying, stop it. Just stop it. Stop this foolhardy spending. Because you're not only sending, spending our seed corn, <laughs> an old farm term for a farm boy here. You know, we're, we're, we're spending next year's crop that we're going to plant to get a crop out of it. We're not only spending our seed corn, we're spending our children, our grandchildren, and even our great-grandchildren's future. Doing so is not even foolhardy. It's not only that. It's even worse. Biblically, the Bible says it's immoral and it's wrong. We have to be careful that our attitudes towards money are the same that God's word teaches. Jesus said it quite clearly. No one can serve two masters. You will either love the one and despise the other or hold to one and reject the other. You cannot serve God and mammon, or many of our translations now all say you cannot serve God and money. So the attitude we have to have is to make sure that we're not caught up in idolatry to money. It's not that we love money per se. I know they have those little commercials about people walking around with their jackpots and putting it in a stroller or playing games with their jackpot, but 
you know, outside of <laughs> Simon Legree and a few uh, funny little advertisements on TV today, nobody really is in love with money. We don't really love it per se. We love what money can purchase. And sometimes for us so much that God loses his place of authority in our life. It is possible to join the world and many in our nation and raise ourselves up as a God and remove Almighty God from the center of our life. In other words, I'm going to spend what I want. I'm going to do it my way. Uh, you do you. You know, the whole concept of advertising that we're hearing now. If we trust God and put him first, we need to realize something. Money will come. God does not withhold money for those who put God first in their lives, who are faithful stewards in their lives, and who commit their trust to God. But when we move that person of God out of the leadership of our life, he no longer sits on the throne, but we sit on the throne, then we've created an idol because we have placed ourselves at the center of our, we have placed ourselves at the center of our lives. One of our nation's founding fathers, Benjamin Franklin, once born, at a republic dies when the people realize they can vote the money out of the coffers. In other words, when people realize they can vote the country's budget and redirect the funds to themselves, there is nothing left to run the nation with. And if we're not careful, that's where we are today. Oh, that would benefit me if my children all had free college. Oh, that would benefit me if my children all had free day daycare. Oh, that would benefit me if, and the, the list goes on and on and on. So we ask ourselves the question of tonight. Is our entire world speeding towards an inevitable financial collapse, producing another Great Depression or something worse? My biggest fear is that we have willingly walked down the road towards spiritual collapse, and when that happens, financial collapse is often behind it. If we're talking about motives, motives for financial sins and following the Bible are all spiritual. When you throw the spiritual out, you have to be very careful that you've just given, you've get, gotten rid of conscience, you've gotten rid of uh, compassion, uh, many times you get rid of uh, mercy towards the needy. So I, I think that we need to see that recent polling indicates that they're on the left are asking for more and more of our country to become socialistic. That is to have a deliberate way to redistribute the wealth and pay the basic needs for everyone in the nation. Now, let me ask you just a simple question. The people that owe $12 trillion of debt on their credit cards, are they going to have a whole lot to share with everybody? <laughs> or is it going to be the people who have wisely saved, taken their money, put it back, invested it, and have it there as an inheritance for their children and their children's children? A quick look at history is going to be a little bit of the focus tonight. Tomorrow, I'm going to spend, I mean, next week, I'll spend a little more time. But I just want to take a focus on Venezuela and the socialism that has come to Venezuela. A generation ago, Venezuela was the richest nation in South America by a long shot. They were not only the richest nation, they were way, way beyond the second one. But the new leaders of the nation embraced socialism. And instead of courting investments from local and foreign sources, the new socialistic Venezuelan government started to take all of their nation's wealth away from their wealthier citizens. And you know what the end result has been? Everybody in Venezuela now is poor. They took the money from the people who knew how to handle money. They dispersed it among all the people who didn't know how to handle money. And now no one has money in Venezuela. The United States is heading towards socialism. It's a popular concept. Many on the left feel it is the only way that will solve what they perceive as the financial problems of our nation. Socialism seems to be where all the energy is focused by these groups. In fact, it is so much so that some just call it the progressive agenda. This coincides with the prophecies that speak of the one world government. For there to be a one world government, the governments of this world will have to seem weaker or at least incapable of stopping a one world government. Revelation 6 and 13 reveal how in the end days, in the future one world government, and I cannot really say beyond what I read in Revelation that the one world government will be formed 
any time before the tribulation. I know there are those that have a big form next year, but I, I really believe that Revelation leads it as part of the buildup of the power that comes to the one world nation and the one world leader uh, that will uh, allow that time to be such a strong, strong opportunity for him to take over the world. A one world leader whom John the Apostle calls the Antichrist will step in. He'll promise to fix the world's economy. He promises that the money will start flowing again and that the merchants will become rich. And if you don't think that's part of the promise of the Antichrist, read Revelation 18 tonight. The destruction of the physical Babylon, where the world begins to divide up her wealth among them and among all the people that were there. Prophetically, then, the debt has piled up beyond belief is going to collapse the economies of the world. The global crisis will cause the nations to cry out for someone or something to solve the crisis, and the someone will be the leader of the entire world, and the something, the new one world government. According to the Bible, we know that this global economic collapse will happen. But Christians, we also know that God is sovereign. This collapse was prophesied to happen thousands of years ago. So we have to put trust that God has got this under control and that he is working the plan as he knows the plan should be worked. So I believe that before the worst of this happens, the believers of this world will be raptured to be with God. Not because God doesn't want any of his people to suffer persecution. There are millions of Christians being persecuted today. It's like just God does not need Christians to reap the fruit of Satan's plans. I do think that's one of the reasons the tribulation period will come after the rapture. Is that God ha will be allowing the Antichrist to produce some horrible, horrible fruit as he kind of destroys the world. And Christians and the church do not to, to need to live under that kind of fruit. What should we do then? Well, the first time Jesus spoke about this subject was Matthew 6. And in the Sermon on the Mount, he encouraged his followers to lay up treasures in heaven and not on earth. The ones on this earth would not last, and only the ones laid up in heaven would last forever. We should advocate for good financial policy nationally. I, when I was younger, we had actually candidates that ran to eliminate the debt. I don't think that's going to happen. As I said, it's billions of dollars for every person. But we, we do need to ask nationally that our leaders begin to take more reasonable ideas about what the government can pay back. Second of all, the best thing we can do personally is to learn from Christian financial teachers how to stay out of debt. One of the things that's going to happen is there will not be pressure, nearly as much pressure against each and every one of us who are out of debt. If there is an economic collapse, then there will be against those who are still carrying large amounts of debt. And why, seriously, why lose everything that you have, everything that you have for your family, everything that you have for your children and children's children, simply because you want a few more pleasurable things and you stick them on a credit card. I think that we, we just need to learn to live without debt. Second of all, we more importantly, we need to make sure that we're investing in things that give eternal rewards. And this is done by promoting the message and teachings of Jesus Christ. I really believe that. Third, I would ask you to encourage and to maintain an eternal perspective. When we study these dark areas of prophecy, like financial collapse or the Antichrist or world dominance of a one world government, I think the wisest thing we can do is perpetually maintain an eternal perspective. I personally try to spend some time, at least once a week and every day if possible, remembering of the incredible glory of the afterlife and one of the surest ways to stay motivated to live faithfully during our relatively short time on earth is to remember that we're strangers on our way to another land, Hebrews eleven sixteen says. We're going to the final frontier of heaven where God himself dwells. You want to live a plodding, lackluster life? Then focus your attention on the things of this world. Make that your mindset. You have the latest dishwasher. 
you have the latest tech. I don't even know what sometimes the latest tech is. So I don't know that I can give you names and, and information here, but do you have the things that our, our, our daughter-in-law sent us something the other day where her uh, stepson has done the, recorded the first live concert on some etherical space age thing that's not real. It's, you know, it's figures doing this and she put it on there for us to watch. I'm thinking, I wouldn't even know how to turn this on on my TV, let alone how to program or dream it. But, you know, some people see that and wow, that's what I have to have. I have to have this, or I have to have that, or, you know, I now that this can happen, I, I need to do this. I feel that a lively, exciting life, think of the things that Christ will provide for us in heaven. And if you don't want to think materialistically, those aren't the greatest blessings of heaven. After all, the things that are worshipped here on the earth materialistically as idols are paving stones and foundation stones, and they're the gridlock, the undergirding, they're the infrastructure of heaven. So we don't even know what those walls are going to totally look like, or the mansions inside, or dozens of other things. But there's some great things about heaven that we do know. Oh, we know that all will live in peace. Oh, we know that there will be a perpetual love, that God himself will be with us, Christ will be with us, that the light of the Lord will shine and light up and illuminate the world for everybody, that there will be not only an absence of war, there will be people who think of war. There will not be fights. There will not be nasty words. There won't be people who go into a group and avoid talking to the people they don't like. Uh, there won't be any of the little irritations that we have in, in this life. Uh, there, they, they won't be there at all. There will be some wonderful things. We'll, we'll get to praise Jesus at all times. Praise God. Praise the Spirit. We'll be in, we'll be in their presence. Part of maintaining an eternal perspective is to beware of our own mortality. We need to pray with the psalmist. Teach us to realize the brevity of life so that we may grow in wisdom. That's Psalm 90. Or Psalm 39, 4, one of my favorite scriptures. Lord, remind me how brief my time on earth will be. Remind me that my days are numbered, how fleeting life is. Christians who wisely think about their mortality are most often the ones who maintain the eternal perspective of Colossians 3. It just makes good sense for us to be concerned about eternal matters. Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes 3.11 affirms that God has planted eternity in the human heart. Now, I believe that's true. I hear many, many non-believers, people who would not consider themselves Christians at all, talk about being in heaven. Talk about their friends being in heaven. Go to a service and you'll have not so much people standing up talking sometimes, but the people around just go, well, yeah, I know they're in heaven now. And you're thinking, they never worshiped Jesus a day in their life. They never, they never did. But God put eternity into the human heart. He planted it so that people do not necessarily, in a broad majority, want life to end. They consider it still going to be going on. Though we live in a world of time, we have intimations of eternity within our hearts. We instinctively think of forever. We seem to intrinsically realize that beyond this life lies the possibility of a future life with our Lord and a shoreless ocean of time. Isn't that cool? A shoreless ocean of time. In other words, there's no time that the waves beat against the, the side of the, of the water. It just goes on forever. It's wondrous to even think about this. We're heaven bent. Our hearts have an inner tilt upward. I've been studying the scriptures for a long time, and from the first book in the Bible to the last, we read of great men and women of God who give evidence that eternity permeated their life and hearts. We read about people like Abel and Noah and Enoch and Abraham and David, each anticipating and even yearning to live with God in eternity. In fact, if you want to take the entire chapter of Hebrews 11, just read that over sometime this week and look at how many people live their life who made it into the scripture as great heroes and heroines because they had an eternal perspective. The psalmist put it this way, as a deer longs for streams of water, so I long for you, O Lord. I thirst for God, the living God. When can I go and stand before him? Psalm 42, 1 and 2. 
And David, king at the time, declares Psalm 23, 6, I'll live in the house of the Lord forever. Well, let's just take a moment as we close tonight and listen to what the author of Hebrews says about Moses in Hebrews 11. It says, it was by faith that Moses, when he grew up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to share the oppression of God's people instead of enjoying the fleeting pleasure of sin. He thought it better to suffer for the work of Christ than to own the treasures of Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He kept right on going because his eyes were on the one who is invisible. It's interesting that the writer of Hebrews said about Moses, he thought it was better to suffer for the sake of Christ than to own the treasures of Egypt. Moses lived 1,500 years before Christ. It's difficult to ascertain how much Moses knew about Jesus Christ, but our text clearly indicates that Moses had a personal faith in Christ on the basis of which he forsook Egypt and everything about Egypt. God had apparently revealed to him things invisible to natural eye, and Moses became aware of another king, another kingdom, and a better reward. Our text indicates that Moses carefully thought through his decision, weighing the pros and cons. He weighed what Egypt had to offer against the promise of what God had for the prophetic future. He concluded that what God had offered in eternity was far superior to anything Egypt would offer on this earth. Moses lived with eternity in view. He made his decisions based on how they impact his existence in the afterlife. So maybe a little gut check for us is the next time we really want to put something on our credit card, ask ourselves, can I stand before Jesus and justify this? Can I look God in the eye and say, oh yeah, this was a good, this was a good deal, Lord. I, I really needed to buy that. Can, can we plead with the Spirit that this was probably the best deal we could get? As God did with Moses, he also reveals future things to you and me from the pages of Scripture. And like Moses, we have a chance to make our life either one of fleeting pleasures of the world, or we can live in light of eternity, choosing purposely to live God's way as we sojourn through an earthly life toward our heavenly country. Hebrews eleven sixteen. We can live now in the light of then. So what is going to happen directs what is happening now. Moses surely would agree with what the Apostle Paul wrote to the Corinthian church, 2 Corinthians 4, 17 and 18. Paul wrote, our present troubles are small and won't last long. Now this is to a group that was being imprisoned for their faith, being persecuted for what they had done, losing jobs because they wouldn't go along with the Corinthian and Greek government. And yet he says this, we produce, their, the present troubles are small and won't last long. Yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. So we don't look at the troubles we can see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen. You know that old jibe at the church that I heard on uh, as a young man, you know, Christianity is just uh, about a pie in the sky by and by, is really ridiculous. Every one of us has things we visualize and have as goals in our life that directs how we live. How, how much better would it be eternal things instead of things of this earth? So we don't look at the troubles we can see now, Paul writes. Rather, we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen. For the things we see now will soon be gone, but the things we cannot see now will last forever. That is how the eternal perspective that allows us to study the collapse of the world's financial situation and still not become depressed or burdened by the fact that it will happen. How can I eliminate fear in this area? Well, I have put it in the right perspective. A relationship with Jesus Christ, a relationship where I've taken all of the steps I could take. In. I have voted for governments that would restrict spending. I have kept myself out of debt. I have provided for my family and generations to come. It's kind of like COVID, I said two weeks ago. The first thing God says is take advantage of what's here, get your shots, get your booster, wear your mask, take caution. 
that's, that's what you need to do. Well, the same is true in this financial area. Take all the cautions you need to take. But once you've taken those cautions, realize this is not the game. This is not even the playoffs. And wasn't that a great game last week between the Bills and the Chiefs? I tell you, I, I, was, I was absolutely floored over in those last two minutes. As great as that was, this is not that game. This is just warm-ups. This is, this is spring training for football or baseball or anything else. All of the real action happens when we go from this life to the next life. And we need to just keep that in mind. For the things we see now will soon be gone, but the things we cannot see now will last forever. Moses gave up temporary pleasure for the sake of his Savior, Jesus Christ. His priorities are where they should have been. What joy Moses' commitment must have brought to the heart of God. Well, next week, we're going to look at a second aspect of what will happen in the world from as we look at how should Christians handle fear in the times. Join us as I spend more time helping us to eliminate the control of fear over any portion of our life, especially in this financial area. Well, God bless you tonight. We will keep you all in prayer, and we will pray that God uh, continues to give us his personal blessings. Chuck, I'm going to turn it back over to you. I think you're on mute, Chuck. Forgot to unmute. Well, thank you, Tom. It's always good to uh, like, uh, be reminded about our focus and to keep it uh, looking up. Hope looks up and uh, not so much on all the horrible things we see going on around us. And, and uh, it's... That's why Christians have a lot better attitude, I think, is that they do have something to hope for. So, well, thank you again, Tom. Uh, that concludes our study tonight. I will be posting tonight's lesson on a Hope Looks Up YouTube site on Thursday. Those of you who would like to participate in prayer time, it will begin now. I'll be stopping the recording.